Utopia. Thanks, Andrew. Good to be here. We're talking about Blindsided, your memoir, and we were just saying before how it's just an incredible name and really powerful name for the book. Tell me why it's such a great name, Blindsided. Well, I guess um, Blindsided sort of means that when something just comes out of the blue and knocks you over without sort of you ever seeing it on, on its way, and also the fact that the stroke that I had in 2012 sort of left me with only about half my sight. So it sort of has all sorts of uh, connotations that you can read into it. But I guess also the third one was the blind side on rugby, in rugby mm. and those sort of terms. So it seems to work on a variety of different levels. And we were also saying, I, I love the cover as well. And mm. I was very worried about the cover being just a portrait of my ugly mug. <laughs> so, you know, big thing looking at me when I go into a bookstore. But I think that, you know, people remember and I remember as me, you know, that was a, a sort of a very typical sort of stance of me preparing to kick a ball at that at goal. So I think the cover looks great. Yeah, well leading when you retired leading point scoring tests and now it's just gotten ridiculous with Johnny Wilkins and Dan Carter. <laughs> yeah. But um did you feel I mean when when I first heard your story, because you were when I was growing up with Rugby Union, you were Captain Fly Half. Mm. Uh Invincible, and then when this happened, were you someone that stopped to smell the roses? Or often did you did you take things for granted when in, in the lead up to this? Or um, yeah. I was, I always knew that I had a fairly charmed life. I yeah. mean, um, and I was very appreciative. It was what I didn't take anything for granted. Um, I realised I was very lucky. You know, a great childhood, played for my country, had good jobs, a great family you know, travelled around, all that sort of thing. And uh, so I was very um, grateful and very aware that I was, was lucky and had this sort of lovely life. So you often hear of people saying, you know, when they have a, a big incident in their life or a big moment, um, like I did with the stroke, that, oh, I'm changed, you know, I'm, I look at life differently now. And I guess what it did for me was after post-stroke was to say, look, you know, you focus on things, and that's what it did. But I was fairly um, grateful and lucky and understood all that beforehand so on that side of things it hasn't really changed for me I'm grateful and lucky and lucky to be here and all that sort of thing and but I guess it sort of focuses narrows down a little bit and you know family's important your kids yeah. are important you know that sort of thing and uh, but I it hasn't really changed me all that much I don't think no that's good so when we look back at your career I'm really interested mm. in this 84 Grand Slam 91 World Cup mm. What's higher when you look back? Oh, gosh. I, I think the 84 Grand Slam was pretty special. It was, you know, I was, I was fairly young at the time, 19, 20, that sort of age, and you come out of school and all of a sudden you're playing with guys on these pitches over these ovals over there that you're tweaking them at Murrayfield and Carter Farms Park, etc. that you'd only seen on sort of grainy pitches at 2.30 in the morning when the, the last tour went there. And um, to be part of a team of 30 mates, really, and we still are, 30 years on, um, and play great rugby, be successful, but at the end of the day we were amateurs and we were, I was a university student travelling around with some mates in, in Europe and uh, it was a great occasion where the, the World Cup was was a little bit different, but it was the same sort of story, you know, we were just a bunch of guys over there playing good football and, and ended up winning a World Cup, so, um, God, it's hard to rank them. Um, I'm equal first. Can we, can, we, can we give two gold we can medals? Go, we, we, I can, we can give two gold medals for this. Okay. How's that for sitting on the fence? <laughs> and one of the parts that I flicked to immediately when I looked at this book that I find intriguing is the difference between amateurism mm. and professionalism. Now, you, it was basically, I think, during the 95 World Cup that they decided to throw the floodgates open. Yeah, it was just afterwards, but just there was a lot of talk going on during the Rugby World Cup, and there was a a, a, a sort of, let's call it a, a, a rugby circus that was being pro, um, proposed during the Rugby World Cup. And that was like the Packer sort of cricket revolution back in the, what, when was that, late 70s, mm -hmm. I guess. And so it was happening in rugby because rugby players for many years had been, you know, they were, um, stands there of 80,000 people. Somebody's making some money out yeah. of this. And it was, certainly wasn't the players. So it was an inve inevitable that rugby would go professional. And it literally went overnight. Um, just after that Rugby World Cup. And one of the most professional sides in that, that you went to, you retired in the 95 World Cup from mm. international footy, but you went to Saracens. That's right. And pretty much, from what I've heard, and it doesn't say in the book from what I've heard, you, you had a huge hand in revolutionising that and really becoming one of the biggest clubs. How did you find the professional era then when you moved over with family and things like that? How did you find life as a rugby player then? Um, it was quite difficult because we're all, it's, it's uncharted waters. How do you behave? 
you know, do you start work at nine and finish at five? And so it was a bit like that at the start. And, you know, it's just having this new toy and how, how do you play with it? How does it work? And, and so for the first year or so, it wasn't, I, I think we'd made a lot of mistakes at Saracens and, and everybody else was doing the same thing. The next year we sort of, and people were still trying to work. I was still trying to work and particularly in London, trying to commute from the centre of London up to North London, it, you know. It could take days at times. Yeah. Um, so it was very... I, I decided to stop working and actually do it full time. And the following year, we all decided that was the way to go. You needed to do that. And we'd train in the morning and, you know, rest in the afternoon and do gym set, you know, all that sort of thing yeah. that they do now. But it was really... Compared to what they do now, we were still very amateur. And, but the big, the big change for me on the playing field was the goal kicking. Um, I suddenly realised from that in the professional era, I was actually, my teammates were getting, a lot of them were getting paid on win bonuses, and yeah. if we'd lose, they get nothing, so, and as a fly half come goal kicker, I would have a big say in whether they ate that week or not, so um, I started game. feeling that pressure, it was a different type of pressure, so I practised a lot more, and hence um, my um, percentages went up, and my teammates got to got to eat a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think being a goalkeeper, sorry, goal kicker in uh, in rugby union, particularly probably where now they might throw the ball around more in those tests, it was really crucial. I think the goal kicking was as the standard has dropped significantly since you were kicking. If, if I can be so rude as to say, yeah. um, do you does it does it prepare you for a pressure that maybe you, any other position in rugby union mightn't? Just all eyes on you. Winning games off the off the end of your own boot. Yeah, it's it's um, it's funny because I often kick at you know smaller games like club games and things like that, and I often found that a little bit harder than some of the the big games because you, when you're in sort of more intimate situations, you can actually hear what people are saying rather than in big stadiums. <laughs> there's this din of noise, and you know, um, the, the the I guess the exception to that rule was in Ireland. Um, and the Irish are very, very uh, polite, let's put it that way, <laughs> where when the, a goal kicker, and they still do it to this day, when the, a goal kicker puts the ball down and lands down road, the 40,000 people in the stadium, there's deathly silence. And I found that quite unnerving because all of a sudden you're lining the ball up and you go, I think they're watching me because there's this <laughs> silence, you know. And, yeah. um, so I, I did find kicking at club level and that sort of thing when, it was, when there was four or 500 people there you know, standing next to you. That was, I, I, you know, you could hear every one of them, what they said, etc. Was, But the whole goal-kicking thing, it, it's funny in rugby because it's a, a very team sport, you know, very mm. team sport orientated, and you rely on each other so much. And within that team sport sort of framework, there's this this one job called goal-kicking that you're on your own. And it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting one, and I've often seen... Um, goal kickers who miss kicks at goal and then try to make it up for it in, in, in play as well and, and do silly things and you've got to try and separate them. Yeah, and um, I can't remember if you were injured a lot in your career but when you talk about being on your own, how difficult was it after this sporting career to then find your hardest battle in rehabilitation being after your career, after the stroke? Uh, yeah, um, I guess after the stroke, um, I think I was very lucky at the start. You know, it was just pure luck that I wasn't uh, affected in a greater to a greater extent, but after that, once I got over the danger period, I think my my understanding of my my body and what where it was in terms of physical capabilities, but also the mental side of things, I think um, having experienced that through sport um, did help a lot, mm. um, and also being reasonably young and reasonably fit, I think helped as well. Um, but at the start, when the stroke happened, it was just pure luck that I, I got through that. But then afterwards, it was I was able to um, understand and monitor in a better sense than, say, somebody that hadn't maybe played at an international level. Mm. Certainly well, helped. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mikey, thank, thank you so much for coming in. It's been a great chat. And congratulations on Blindside. It's just it's an amazing book. And I think it, it's going to be one of the sporting memoirs of the year, no question. I hope so. And I hope people enjoy reading it. It's... Um, I think it's a good story and I know how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find out how it ends as well. You can grab your copy of Blindsided from booktopia.com.au right now.